Hi all, this is Yano Almighty and welcome to this video. So finally I have come back once again a Fisher game. It has, it has been almost a month, but yeah, I have just been doing other stuff, showing you other games and I think we are ready to get back to that story. So Robert James Fisher here playing against Friedrich Olofsson at the 1959 Zurich tournament. And as you all know, probably by now in 1959 uh, actually Fisher uh, left his family uh, left his country and decided to dedicate his whole life to chess as a very young boy first he started with a tour in South America so I have showed you some games from Mar del Plata tournament also some games from the Santiago tournament and now he decided to move on to Europe and the first tournament in line was actually the third tournament of 1959 and there he played against a very strong elite players I would say of that time you had players like Mikhail Tal you had here Friedrich Olofsson uh, Wolfgang Unziker um, uh, Paul Keres many other strong players but of course I will talk more about that in the next few videos about Fischer since I'm going to cover a couple of games with Fischer playing against, against those strong players and the first game that I wanted to show you early in the tournament I think uh, here Fischer played with the black pieces against Friedrich Olofsson so let me just show you the game uh, we see c4 here, Olofsson starts with that, and of course, as we all know, Fischer will do his usual setup. No matter what uh, you, your opponent plays, knight to f3, c4, d4, uh, Fischer goes for the king's Indian setup. So after knight to c3, we see g6, d4, bishop to g7, e4, and now, of course, d6. Here, continuing with knight to f3 and castles. So... The usual setup is finished for Fisher. Bishop to e2, keeping in the main line, and e5. We already went a couple of times over this variation, uh, all of the decisions that could be made in here, uh, so I'm just going to continue. So white here plays d5. Knight from b to d7, since now the c5 square is uh, yeah, a very good square for the knight. And here we see bishop to g5 going about pinning that knight h6 immediately, bishop to h4, and nowadays you would see even variations such as g5, so pushing that uh, yeah, uh, very soon in the game, bishop to g3 and then knight to h5, and if knight moves, knight can come on f4, and this looks very promising for, for black, having the knight on f4, if uh, the bishop captures pawn captures, releasing this bishop, it is a very good situation here for black, so you don't have to be afraid of pushing the g5 pawn, yeah, that, uh, that's soon in the game. But Fischer decides to go for a little bit more passive variation. He plays a6. So not even a5 to stop b4 after knight comes to c5. But we have knight to d2, which just stops g5 knight to h5. So Fischer goes for queen to e8, unpinning the knight. g4. So Olofsson starts right from the start uh, with an idea of pushing the pawns. It is a pretty common idea, of course, in the King's Indian. But here, g4... Uh, yeah, makes a state statement definitely, and uh, Fisher now has to think about how to actually uh, go about tackling this position, what he needs to defend himself, and what is uh, when is actually the right time to go about and strike on the queen side, maybe open up the center. First knight to h7, so that g5 doesn't come with the tempo, and now queen to c2. We see knight to g5, and knight to g5 comes with an idea of that knight wants to come on h3, because knight from h3 can jump to f4. I know it seems like a lot of moves with the knight, but knight on f4 would mean a great advantage for black, because now the g4 pawn is pushed, of course, the e4 pawn is pushed, and uh, little can you do about uh, just moving that knight from there, and if you capture him, he captures captures on f4 once again, releasing this very strong bishop. So h3 stops that idea. We have knight to c5, now adding pressure on e4, and queenside castle. So now Fischer knows that he needs to go for the queenside attack. First he plays bishop to d7, because he has an idea, um, which you will see very soon. Now we have f3, and uh, the idea behind f3, I want to solidify my pawns here, move the bishop and then start pushing the pawn. So first h4 and then maybe g5 or h5. So we have knight to a4, so that was the idea. Maybe it seems a little bit too slow, because after knight captures, bishop captures and b3, bishop has to go back to d7, and still you haven't pushed any of the pawns, but it will, be prove, it will prove worthy of the task. First, uh, what you need to do, so white played bishop to f2, of course, with the idea of pushing h4, but of also transferring the bishop on e3 to include him into the attack. 
So here Fisher needs to start immediately with the attack of yeah of attack of his own. First c5, and uh, c5 of, of course blocks in the position more, but it kind of puts uh, black to the test. Do you want to capture? If you capture, then simply pawn captures, and the b file is open. D5 can come as a resource, and then after that even e4. So the whole point is to actually release the bishop i've been saying this the whole game but uh the king's indian bishop on g7 is a very strong piece and uh as soon as you get him to yeah just have an have an influence on the whole board uh yeah you're just becoming the stronger and the stronger side so here white definitely doesn't want to do that he doesn't want to open up the position but c5 is also a move that doesn't allow c5 for white of course it wouldn't come into this variations but it uh, allows b5 for black as well so we have h4 by white knight has to go to h7 and now it's a uh, time to stop for a little bit because most such uh, moves such as h5 and g5 don't really work of course f4 doesn't work because pawn can simply capture and then bishop from g7 yeah just killing it on this diagonal uh, but uh, if h5 is pushed g5 can be pushed and if g5 is pushed h5 can be pushed so you need to find another idea how to go about attacking uh, the king's side and Olafsson does it so he plays first bishop to e3 and after b5 he plays a knight to b1 so he is not afraid of pawn capturing or anything here he wants to remaneuver the knight to be a defending piece but also have a square for the queen on d2 so that both of the pieces can attack attack on h6 as you can see the knight is on h7 and being there the king doesn't have an option to come on h7 and actually defend the pawn and as soon as you attack the pawn twice if either of the pawns be, are being pushed then you can simply capture and open the h or the g file so fisher thinks that this is actually the the right time to actually make a counter and he starts with f5 and this this le this leads to a series of exchanges first pawn captures on g5 pawn captures on g5 pawn captures on g5 and bishop to f5 so black has a, a wide open king side yeah not really so you have the pieces in front of the king but the pawns are lost so what might needs to do is include the rooks and the pieces and it will be a better game but does he have time to do that first queen to d2 so you don't want to play something like bishop to d3 because after the exchange on d3 rook can pick up the pawn on f3 and black is okay so queen to d2 twice attacking on h6 but we have e4 so black is looking for opening up the position and finally the bishop is now yeah very good on this diagonal but we have rook from d to g1 attacking the bishop and preparing bishop to h6 pawn captures on f3 and bishop to h6 uh, white has time to actually capture this pawn because the pawn capture or queen capture runs into bishop to g7 and if queen captures knight captures uh yeah you're just uh better here with white pieces so um so this is why this doesn't work and you have to play rook to a7 to defend on g7 bishop to g7 rook to g7 rook to g7 and king to g7 and now bishop to d3 uh, bishop to f3 doesn't work because of bishop to b1 uh, yeah you have captured the piece and your bishop on f3 is attacked so now maybe you think okay queen to c3 is what check and defend the bishop but queen to f and that runs into queen to e5 and now your queen is attacked you have to exchange and still your bishop will be attacked black will go out of this with a piece up so you cannot capture here so bishop to d3 is played now pawn captures on c4 fisher isn't in a hurry to capture any more pieces he has a very nice pass pawn after all of this rook to g1 check king has to go to h8 and now queen to c3 and uh, it is really strange to me that uh, Olofsson decided to go in all of these exchanges because after this we will see queen to e5, queen captures, pawn captures, bishop captures on f5, rook captures on f5 and pawn captures on c4. Uh, white is actually the one who ends up being in a lost position. So in a lost endgame uh, he has a pass d pawn, of course a very dangerous pass d pawn, but the f pawn and the e pawn are much more yeah, dangerous than the d pawn so here fisher plays quite simply knight to f6 and the combination of the rook the knight and the spawn will prove to be deadly against white 
uh, there is actually no way uh, you don't have enough temples to actually stop this pawn from being promoted. Here white plays the best move, knight to d2, but this runs into simply f2. And now what do you need to do? If you play the rook on f1, then simply e4, e3, e2, and the position is just lost. So yeah, and uh, the main idea behind, of course, knight to f6 is that you can p push e4 without a problem. So we have to move the rook somewhere else. All of some played rook to h1, but now the e4 pawn, the e pawn comes first e4, and here uh, white could have played knight to f1, and uh, uh, quite simply run into something like, okay, rook to f3 needs to be played so that you can push e3, but after king to d2, you cannot do it anymore, and black has to play something like this to go about capturing a pawn, but d6 is also a threat, so here white would have more chances, he is in a slightly uh, worse position, but uh, yeah, it would be much harder for Fisher to go and win this game. Uh, actually, e4 here immediately proved to be not such a good move, maybe knight to h5 here with the ideas of knight to g3. Of course, after knight to e4 you can play even uh, this, but okay. So even bring the king closer to I on the d-pawn. There are a lot of things that you can do here, but uh, e4 kind of gives white an idea to prolong the game. But uh, all of a sudden, unfortunately for him, makes a mistake. He brings the king closer, plays king to d1, and now everything is forced. First e3. The knight is attacked, so knight moves to f1, attacking the rook, the, uh, sorry, attacking the pawn, and rook to e5, uh, planning to push for e2, forking the king and the, the knight, so king to e2, and now on the final move, knight to h5. Knight to h5 comes with the threat of knight to f4, gives a check, king has to move, then you push e4, e2, sorry. And if the knight captures on e3, then of course knight to g3 checks the king and captures the rook. So here in this position, Olofsson played king to f3, and after e2, he just resigned the game. And yeah, it doesn't seem like, um, through the whole game, Fischer didn't uh, like, so he proves once again that the king's Indian is a very valuable tool when playing with black against moves such as c4, d4, knight to f3. But uh, on the other side, on the other hand, uh, he didn't really prove that... Um, with just playing the pawns in that f5 move, it wasn't all that sure that you can go about winning that game. But all of all of a sudden, just made uh, a few positional mistakes, and the final one with uh, not playing knight to f1, and yeah, that proved worthy of a game. And yeah, that is pretty much it for this video. I would like to thank you for watching it, and I will see you next time.